Welcome to this, the third in our series of webinars for corporate travel professionals. My name is Mark Harris. I'm your moderator for the next hour when we look at the whole issue of service departments, short term rentals, and corporate housing. Just what is the best option? Now, over the course of the next few minutes, I'm going to give you a little bit of background information. This webinar is part of the Engage series, Engage being the content stream for the Urban Living Festival. We'd like to thank our sponsors this morning, Blue Orchid Hotels and the residents. Little date for your diary now, Engage, which as I said is part of the Urban Living Festival. It's a track of content purely for corporate travel professionals. So get this date into your diaries, Wednesday the 25th of November. That's at Tobacco Dock in London and we hope to see you there. Travel Intelligence Network is my company. We're bringing you these webinars. Our business is content for travel, hospitality and meetings providers. We've been doing this since 2005. Many of you on the call will be hopefully be familiar with the Global Service Department's industry report, which we originated, the meetings industry report and also the Service Department awards. So our business is all about thought leadership through education. Let me get you a little bit more information now about the Urban Living Festival itself. Urban Living has been created to reflect the fragmentation of the accommodation sector. More choices than ever before. So we're putting an event on or in through international hospitality media that is going to address all of these issues. So 25th to the 26th of November. Make sure you have that in your diaries. A little bit of housekeeping as far as the uh, next hour is concerned. Uh, you'll see the details there on the slide. The key thing here is that we want you to ask as many questions as you wish. Unlike many webinars, which will leave you to, uh, to have a session at the end for Q&A, we'd like you to ask questions as we go. You can do that through the chat function or by sending an email to the address on your screen. That will then come through to me and I will then put your questions to our panel this morning. You might not like the answers, but they'll all be very straight and direct ones. So let's get into our session today. These are the accommodation experts who will be joining the discussion, and I'd like them all to introduce themselves to you in turn, starting with Vivi. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm the CEO and co-founder for Altavita. Altavita is essentially the GDS for alternative accommodation. Um, we have a cloud-based uh, business to employee accommodation platform connecting top multinational companies with usually over 5,000 employees um, and structured global mobility program when relocating their employees to property managers who can deliver corporate standards and demonstrate duty of care. We now have about 20,000 properties on our database and present in about 80 markets worldwide. So prior to Altavita, I was an investment banker uh, for five years, relocating from New York City to Hong Kong and then to London, which means that I'm a product of global telemobility myself. And I spent about eight years in portfolio management in real estate, um, residential, industrial and commercial assets and in Asia Pacific, including Japan, Australia and the UK. Thank you. Thank you, Vivi. And we'll move on to Kevin. Thank you, Mark. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Kevin Carr. Um, I'm working for UBS um, in the travel management team based in the UK. Um, my role is, um, my responsibility is to manage the global accommodation program for UBS. Um, mostly uh, that's for the transient side of the business. So we have a, a, a mainstream hotel program, VIP and uh, service department program. I've been um, at UBS for uh, a few years um, and I've been in the industry for about 30 uh, in total. So uh, I've been around the block a bit. Thanks, Kevin. And Joe. Um, okay, yeah. So talking about being around the block a little bit, Kev, um, <laughs> unfortunately, I've been in the industry now for approximately 30 plus years. I'm not going to give you the exact number. Um, accommodation, hospitality sector, um, service departments for the last 16 years. Um, worked with or worked for um, Intercontinental Hotels, for Marriott, um, for Bridge Street, for 
Taz, and now um, the um, a, a director and co-owner of uh, Cat Worldwide. Um, and we're, we've been lucky enough to celebrate our first anniversary, um, uh, socially distanced first anniversary in June of the launch of our business. And uh, we're a global agnostic corporate accommodation and apartment booking agent. Thank you, Joe. So Steve, have you been around the block? <laughs> well, I, I did run to work. So uh, I ran 8K into the office and uh, yes, I guess so. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I, I, I started my career in hospitality in 2005, running a backpackers hostel with 500 beds in central London, and then went on to set up my own budget hotel chain where we grew from London to Brighton and Moscow. That's, a, that's, that's not a socially distant story. Um, and where I am today is I'm CEO of Anglo Educational Services and the residents, the residents being luxury service apartments, uh, very much uh, the extended stay model. Our average length of stay is between four to five and 60 days. And we work with a number of agents uh, uh, that in, in the industry, um, as well as some direct. Um, and Anglo is a, and we have 61 apartments across four locations in central London. Anglo is a full service uh, educational business. Uh, we have 200 apartments across central London. We have a study center, faculty. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, uh, and look after mainly American university students, uh, although uh, through lockdown we have branched out to working in the Gulf. Uh, but yeah, that's me. Okay, Steve, thank you very much. Thank you and welcome to all of our panellists this morning. So, over the next 50-55 minutes, we're going to talk about service departments, short-term rentals and corporate housing. Just what is the best option for a corporate program? There are five key issues that we are going to focus on as part of this discussion. We're going to look at the key differences between serviced accommodation, short-term rentals and the rest. We're going to ask why there aren't more non-hotel products on GDS and TMC systems. We're going to look at what the barriers are to greater use of short-term rentals and corporate housing. We're going to ask what hotels and service departments can learn from other models and vice versa. And what our panellists expect the accommodation market to look like in three years time. Two or three statistics to put onto the table. Um, and many of you will be familiar with this from our own service departments industry report. The service department sector is considered con continuing to see dramatic increase in supply and it's been very dramatic over the course of the last 10 years. We've seen the rise of Airbnb, Focus Wire earlier on this year said that 2020 would be the year of uh, Airbnb. Is that the case? And in, in parallel to that, our events industry could be seeing losses of anywhere up to £60 billion. Factor into that the growth of co-living and co-working and we have a fascinating sector. We're going to start the session now with a quick poll and we'd like to uh, everyone who's on the call to take part in this poll. It's a straight yes, no question. And the question is this, do you feel comfortable traveling right now? So if you feel yes, do the appropriate press. If no, do that. Please make your choices now. Okay, we're going to move on to this. We've got a technical issue behind the scenes there, so we'll come back to that a little bit later on. So let's get into our, our session. And my first question to each of our panellists is very much in the line of the key differences between service accommodation, short-term rentals, and the rest. And just as I'm saying that, technology being the way it is, the result of that poll has come through. So we have 52% of people uh, saying that they are comfortable traveling right now and 48 saying not. So let's come to the panel on that. Your observations, please, on that. Broadly a 50-50 split. Let's bring uh, Vivi in first, please. What's your view on, on that, uh, that result of people feeling tra comfortable traveling or not? 
Um, yeah, uh, we, we specialize in relocation. Um, we've seen quite a lot of employees' um, relocation programs have moved forward. So instead of being canceled, they, they were basically being delayed um, back in March, April, May. So we've started to see a lot of new movements from that end. And we asked the client ourselves, so why do you need to move um, your employees if they're working from home anyway? Um, and their answers are usually, well, their talent and skill sets are actually required in that region. Um, so whilst they work from home temporarily, um, but that situation may change and they are, uh, it's necessary for them to be registered in those regions where they are relocating to. Kevin, what's the, what's the feedback coming from your travelers within, within UBS? We've seen there a fairly evenly split audience. Your take, please. I'm kind of surprised at that that um, that result actually, because I would have expected people in the industry to be perhaps more, um, uh, you know, uh, looking to travel or, or be happy to travel. Um, I think a 50-50 split is probably the way that I would expect the general population out there to sort of to to really respond, because I think we we all see probably in our daily lives, you know you know 50% of the population are quite happy to get out there and get, and get out and, and socialize and 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 you know move away from lockdown while 50% of people are still sitting inside their houses and not not prepared to, to get outside right so so it, at our firm I think you know the travelers we, we haven't we're not getting a great deal of engagement with our travelers because our business leaders are, are telling us right now that travel is not a priority and we should not be getting our people out on the road so engagement um with the travelers themselves is is limited um, we're not we're not hearing that people are desperate to get to get traveling i guess that's the the main response steve are you surprised by that uh, that poll result no it's um it's a bit like donald trump when he got in a lot of people said they wouldn't vote for donald trump uh, but they did. And it's a bit like a lot of people in the industry say, oh, we've got to travel, we've got to have customers here, we've got to get people in our uh, hotels or our apartments. But if, as, as leaders in the industry, we don't lead by example, it becomes quite difficult. It's completely understandable that people are uncomfortable to travel. Um, and I think Kevin's right. I think there is a 50-50 split. I mean, we, we cover from youth travel up to sort of high-end VIPs. And... What is interesting, particularly from the States, is the sentiment from young travellers there uh, to study abroad, to even come away for educational tours for a couple of weeks, is actually very high. And probably, if there weren't the restrictions in place now with quarantine, we would have had more students this fall than we would have done last year. Partly because of what's going on in the States, there's a, a great shift in, in terms of a drive from younger people to, to get out and to, to get about. Um, but obviously a lot of the uh, issues around coronavirus have um, potentially built themselves into people with higher budgets uh, who, you know, an older age who may be more susceptible uh, to, to, the, to the virus and therefore are feeling more uncomfortable to travel. So I think, um, I'm not surprised, I don't know the age and demographic of everyone on, on the panel, but I think that that is the reality. And I think, you know, going into more detail is that I think people will travel with purpose more and therefore the two day trip that, you know, UBS sends someone to Zurich for a couple of days rather than actually going for two weeks and really making the most of it and having more meetings and, and more engagement is probably where people are thinking now. And, and traveling with purpose, I think, will become more and more important because of the fear of getting stuck or getting quarantined or, or whatever it may be. So Joe Layton, how does that all factor into the choices of accommodation and the different types of model out there? Which of the different categories of alternative accommodation do you feel are now best place to exploit? Yeah, so um, first of all, I agree with all the panellists, unusually, and um, I, I do actually agree with what, what Kevin was saying. Um, because I do think um, that as an industry, if we're not willing to travel, we're not going to be driving um, the economy forward with traveling. So I think the question was quite interesting because um, we've been fortunate enough to deal with um, a group to keep us busy during this period, but it's been key workers constantly around the UK. Um, so I think defining travel, whether it includes an aeroplane or not, is actually another um, way to actually ask the question. 
Um, people are happy to travel, but maybe not to get on aeroplanes. I think that's maybe a differentiator um, that would make a difference to the questions. A lot of people holidaying in the UK right now, which means that they are traveling. So the definition of the travel, I think, um, would have probably got a different result, Kev, from, the, from what's actually come out. Mm -hmm. I, I think from my perspective, how that affects uh, alternative accommodation, um, I've I booked a huge amount of alternative accommodation during COVID more than what I did during um, um, the, the six months previous or the eight months previous. And one of the reasons why is that a lot of the alternative accommodation providers actually were still willing to take business when large apart hotels were actually having to close down because of the cost of running their units was very different. Um, and I completely respected that, um, you know, the cost of, of running a large uh, five star establishment or four star establishment with the staffing, if you're not going to get over 50% becomes a, a high cost to the company. So I think um, from my perspective, there's three key areas, three differentiators that make a massive difference to um, what accommodation you'd use in normal times. And that's obviously going to be um, the location that you need to go to um, and whether it's a primary, secondary or tertiary location, it's going to be the mix of business in that location and what it receives. So is it corporate business? Is it a leisure dominated arena? Is it mainly for projects? Are there a lot of groups? Is it near to, you know, business hubs that are maybe not city centres? And the third thing, which is most important um, for the different kinds of um, businesses that we book into and, and that we source into, is whether they're corporate housing. So are they looking after families? Are they in Relo? Are they residential? Is it um, predominantly city centres, shorter length of stays? Is it small, short business projects? They're going to use the, the city centre properties and apart hotels and there's fewer corporate housing in those areas. And then for me, what's happened is I've been booking into Canterbury or Whitehaven. Alternative accommodation really comes into its own when you've got a project that arrives somewhere and there is no other accommodation available, inclu including hotels that have been closed down. So I think from my, from my perspective, short answer is the location, the mix of business and the length of stay creates the need or the requirement for any particular uh, kind of accommodation for a corporate or for, for anyone travelling. And Vivi, is that, is, does that uh, marry up with your own with your own uh, experiences? Um, from our what we are seeing is we've uh, specialised in um, individual apartments, so not quite the one building operated um, apartments. Um, so this is not quite the Airbnb style, which have the unpredictability that hit and miss element uh, with the guests having apprehension when booking. Um, there's another type of um, kind of cluster, which unfortunately hasn't gotten its own name yet, but these are these investment homes, flats, apartments that are not in the same building, but they are operated by the same property managers, companies who have been traditionally hospitality first uh, before they are a startup or anything else and, and delivers consistent quality in management. And I think that's quite attractive. It's a blend uh, between kind of uh, privacy as well as, um, you know, duty of care being taken off, taken care of, demonstrated, and then uh, matching up with what corporates uh, would require when it comes to their vendor management. Okay, so Stephen, from a, for a, 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 as an operator, uh, of the, res the residents, what are your your thoughts on this? Yeah, well, I think um, obviously my background is hospitality, um, and um, within the organisation, we have been running through um, through through COVID. Um, the residents brand itself was we were quite fortunate; we had a number of people book in early March, and we were actually pretty much full throughout the whole period. We've a we've added new buildings uh, since, which. Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, the developers who were building the properties were very quick, quicker than we had expected. So we ended up with 80 new apartments, uh, uh, 30 for the residents uh, in two locations on the 1st of June, uh, which actually ended up being quite good timing because we, we were pretty full uh, in the other buildings. Uh, we, we hosted key workers in our student housing, but it, again, they're residential. We, we ended up with 50 doctors and nurses and, and ambulance drivers staying with us for free uh, where it cost. Um, uh, all over London but I think it's a flexibility of the apartments um, our luxury end we've had families relocating so we can we can put a zip and link bed into the second bedroom uh, we've had some uh, more techie companies booking with us and and, and those uh, those staff require super high 
speed internet, which again in, a, in, a, in a, an individual apartment is easier to cater for than in, in the necessarily the, the big infrastructure of a, of a large hotel. Or, or the request like, you know, can I, I'm coming here, I've got a quarantine for the first 14 days, can I have a linen drop and Sainsbury shopping? It's the stuff that we can do. And I think that flexibility has come into its own through the restrictions that happened over the last three months. And even now, where people are maybe a little bit more um, nervous with, you know, uh, high volume spaces of hotel lobbies and, and what's not. So uh, they don't necessarily completely cocoon themselves, but they, they find that they're, they're very comfortable in their space. And we have always been flexible, but we've really built that service around that individual guests or, or even company's needs for that particular time, which has changed over the last, particularly over the last two months where cleaning was then allowed again and, and a lot of our tenants were like, yes, please, I'd like you to come in and clean the flats properly and, and so forth. So I think that's been important and our relationships with the agents and them trusting us to deliver that particular company's COVID policy has also been really important, which again, I think as Vivi said, is, is when it's an individual apartment can be a little easier than, than necessarily trying to do it mass across a whole, um, whole large, large property or part hotel. Apologies. <laughs> so Kevin, just to, to bring you bring you in at this point, surely though, isn't it the case that the best accommodation option is what fits the needs and circumstances of the traveller at the time of the trip? Are we actually making too much of all the various differences that are there between accommodation types? I think that's right, actually. I mean, I think in our in our company right now, we, we're not seeing sort of regular business travel which is where you would expect people to stay in, you know, a normal hotel, a normal accommodation. So, you know, I think the only sort of the only type of bookings that we're seeing now are the unusual, the projects, mm -hmm. um, the relocations um, and those kind of sort of those mm -hmm. kind of requirements are bread and butter for service departments and for um, corporate housing long stay you know options right so but I, I go back to what i said earlier i mean we're not we're not traveling an awful lot right now um so the volume is, is very very small um and it's just about you know i think as as a as a buyer it's just about having sort of all options available right you've got to have a flexible program and a flexible policy that allows your you know individual requirements to be met um every time you know, and, that, and that's, I think, what, what a corporate program should look like. I mean, one of the, the most unusual requests we've had, uh, well, we've had a lot of them, but uh, is pets. So we've had a lot, of, a lot of people requesting pets. Or, uh, uh, so we, first of all, it was office desks, then it was pets. So I think the largest we have is, is a Great Dane, which is it's a little large. Uh, so we had to put them in a garden flat, but the majority is a cat or, or, a, or a, a smaller dog. But... Obviously, again, it's making that person, if they're relocating for a project, to feel really at home uh, with the restrictions in place. And, and uh, I think that flexibility has, has been an, impo an important thing, although it has brought its own challenges in some ways. Okay, so we are the best part of 40 years into service departments in the UK. And it could be said that there's a very limited amount of inventory that is non-hotel on GDS on TMC systems, on online booking tools. Now, if we, if we start from the basis, if it's taken service departments 35, 40 years to not crack it, what chance of other providers? Let's go to Vivi first. Sure, thank you. Um, so GDS is obviously uh, the go-to uh, system for travel industry. Um, um, but to my knowledge, GDS is probably still the best option for flights. Um, so if you're in airline industry, there is no other choice. But for accommodation, um, it actually isn't. Uh, if you're a travel agent, um, OTAs arguably um, probably has more inventory um, and has similar API capabilities. Um, for TMCs who, who want to have a rich content, for example, uh, Booking.com and Expedia have more accommodation options. Um, Booking.com itself has 29 million listings on their website, but they have 2 million properties in their affiliate programs and Expedia has about 1 million, which means that you know, anyone who connected their API could tap into that. 
Um, and then from GDS perspective, um, we're talking about Sabre Hamadius in uh, Apollo Travel Port. Um, they seem to earn their fees per booking, not by commission. So economics is not good enough for GDS for extended stays because frequency is low, uh, booking tends to be longer. Essentially, there is no, not enough demand on that side. Um, so in terms of their content themselves, um, they're pretty much satisfied with what Booking.com and Expedia, who are actually connected to them, um, um, in terms of content, in terms of what they can offer to their um, demand agents. And then for, for hotels, um, actually, unfortunately, GDS only has the, the basic information, like price and availability. Um, so there is that, there's a lot of room for GDS to improve in terms of content, not just beyond price and, and availability. Um, all the amenities around the properties, um, all the descriptions, um, the surrounding area, all of that is, is not available. Um, so my point is that maybe there is an opportunity for us to, as an industry, um, to campaign to the big guys, to the, all the GDS uh, companies, to, to perhaps uh, structure in such a way that it is more percentage-based percentage based commission rather than per booking, which means that um, per booking um, value has a meaningful uh, demand-driven proposition for the GDS. The speakers, what do you think about that particular point? Can I come in here actually, Mark, and just um, following on from, um, from those comments? I think it's quite interesting because I have been in the industry for nearly those 40 years and um, and I've always enjoyed the GDS, but it is obviously limited, which we just reviewed. But I also think that um, the technical side of service departments is actually really important to consider here. So when you've got a low risk, short stay booking up to 28 nights, um, that's got um, good terms and conditions already included, it's easy to book on the GDS. So the apart hotels are doing very well out of um, the travel management companies and anyone that accesses um, extended stay up to 28 nights. It just becomes a lot more difficult once you hit the 29 nights and over and the kind of traveller changes and the kind of accommodation changes that's needed. And I do think um, what holds back um, the, um, the the industry for moving forward is actually quite a good reason it's actually about service and it's about profit i think um there's a lot of extended stay bookings that have, for me for instance if i'd have filled every single unit and not allowed people to extend i would have had absolute bedlam over the last three to four months of not being able to extend people in there because the next person's already booked so i think the option to extend that does actually still exist quite heavily especially in corporate housing um, and anyone that takes over 30 nights stays, that's an absolute must for us to continue in our industry. However, the service side of that is, is challenging because it, it's like working major uh, meetings events. It's a, it's a high investment and you've got to look at your commercials and your cancellation terms. And actually putting those cancellations and commercial terms onto the GDS would be an absolute nightmare. When you're booking globally and you're using even apart hotels in Asia, there's a rather large a document that's going to come through before they allow you through the door, um, which is not going to be usable potentially on, on any GDS or in any system. So it does take, you know, the, the agents are taking a lot of this um, pressure away from the bookers. But there's, there's a, a, a multitude of reasons, um, including length of stay, um, service, profit as well, profit for, um, for the extended stay. They have to run at high occupancies. So they don't want short stays in there, except for if they're gap filling. Um, if, if they're built for an extended stay use, they want extended stay business. Okay, I've got a question to, that's coming from the, uh, from the audience, and I'm going to put it to you first, Steve. And the question is this. Is the term alternative accommodation no longer relevant, particularly with lots of hotels remaining shut during the crisis? Bring Steve in first, and then any of the other panellists, please come in afterwards. Steve. I've had this conversation with Pierce for a number of years over a beer. Um, is I think alternative accommodation uh, is often used by property people to create new asset classes to have a new source of investment. Uh, people have been staying in other in, in, in apartments or homestays for, for years. It was like when there was this boom in investment in hostels 10, 15 years ago. The, the YHA is 100 years old. It's not, it's not new, it's not necessarily alternative. And a lot of the big hotel brands have always had apartments or suites 
attached to those hotels. So I think from, you know, from a, 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 a consumer's perspective, an apartment is an apartment, whether it's long stay, short stay, a part hotel, depending on the facilities. And that's really where it is. I think where sometimes you get the blurred lines is where the corporates who are developing the asset classes end up in the marketing department talking about the toilet alternative accommodation. I think it confuses it. And actually, you know, uh, th there is great simplicity to what is out there in the apartment model. Um, you know, going back to the last point, you know, if you, if you do extended stay, it's wonderful to fill in the voids. But the reality is you often get pushed down rankings on OTAs or GDS if you don't have the availability all the time, which is mm -hmm. why people like the cast like to work on a more personal basis with agents because we work together to, to either extend or fill in the voids or anything else. Mm -hmm. That's just basic hospitality. That's the same as a hostel, same as an apartment, same as a, as a branded hotel. And I think it's not really alternative anymore. You know, people stay in tents and glamping caravans and various other things. It's, it's, it's just that the, the, the accommodation market is more varied and because of the internet, everyone can see it now. And before a lot of this, what is now called alternative accommodation was slightly hidden because it didn't have the exposure through different platforms now uh, that they can get. And I, and I think really um, apartments are very much on, maybe there's not as many, but it's, I, I really don't see it any different to a hotel and therefore it's not alternative. In my opinion. Anybody else can let's like a view here? <clears throat> Well, I think from, from a to travel buyer's perspective, I think there needs to be a bit more honesty out there around what, you know, what is alternative accommodation and, and where service departments and long stay accommodation actually is sort of applicable. Um, I think there's the industry to me seems to be very much selling um, itself to corporates as, as a, a, an alternative to hotels you know particularly for short stays but actually you know our experience is is that that we're really only gap filling i think as joe said earlier you know the it seems to me that the bread and butter business for these for these operators is actually the longer stay you know the the 29 night plus and really the you know the short stay business is really is is, is actually just very limited um, and, and like I say, gap filling. And that's why we don't see, I think, the, the sort of content being distributed via the regular channels, you know, like the travel agencies or the uh, online booking tools, the GDS, because mm -hmm. ultimately the accommodation doesn't suit that, that kind of mainstream, you know, that mainstream requirement, you know, short stay, quick turnover, um, uh, a, a regular transient business which is what you know what, what I'm responsible for so you know I think we've been trying to plug in a you know a sort of an automated um, type of um, service department program you know live bookings um, uh, but it's just it's just it's just so difficult because you know the ma the mainstream sort of technology solutions and, and industry solutions are just not there um, and 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 I think that's because ultimately the, the 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 companies the operators themselves really if they're honest they would they would they would rather have the long stay business so vivi bring you in at this point how should non-hotel providers then be really getting into the minds of travel buyers and others others like kevin does the sector for example need a body there to market itself what are your thoughts and i'll then bring the other panelists in yeah sure um i think it's really important for for us as the um kind of um the service providers to the corporates to, to make sure that uh, we can demonstrate duty of care which you know to make sure that their uh their well-being security safety are taken care of um particularly when when it comes to relocation because companies expect their employees to move their life to a foreign countries. So we play uh, a key role in ensuring um, that duty of care is demonstrated from uh, maintaining appropriate insurance, how they conduct data protection, for example, GDPR is super key. 
Um, and then personal safety, uh, security safeguards, um, things like testing um, the fire system, emergency exit, um, fire extinguishers, so on and so forth. These are all um, important factors that um, coming from uh, the short-term rental part of a com um, alternative accommodation, uh, managing many individual um, landlords, many individual um, properties that are managed by uh, different property managers. So having that in place, a system in place, making sure they are regularly um, tested, regularly um, evaluated, and make sure that they, are, uh, they, they all match up with what they set themselves to do from the beginning. Joe, do you want to come into that point? And specifically, why haven't we got a single body that actually handles sales and marketing for this sector? Sorry, is that to me, Mark? Yes, please. I, personally, I think that the um, sales teams um, across the globe are doing a brilliant job of marketing um, uh, service to accommodation in, in, and extended stay. And um, I do think that it's, it's always going to be slightly more niche um, because of the number of units that are available in key markets. And the fact that, as Kevin said, unless your model actually has an extended stay requirement for sort of like five to, to 28 nights, um, you're probably going to use more hotels. But I do think many apart hotels are absolutely built to take those short stay um, bookings, I really do, and I and I do think they reflect the hotel terms and conditions. So I think, I think by length of stay, you you'll find a different appropriate um, solution. But I do um, I do agree that um, if you have to be active, you've got to be highly active. Um, there's lots of different ways of being active. You can be part of. I know that GBTA have got their issues at the moment, but there's GT, GBTA, there's ITM, there's um, TAMS, the new um, advisory team for um, that you can get messages out about extended stay uh, accommodation and what you're doing. Um, there's also the associations, there's ASAP, there's uh, CHPA, there's SABA, there's a lot of uh, ways that we can get out. The only thing is that we must not end up in an echo chamber just talking to ourselves. The biggest challenge in the service department industry for me is that we talk to ourselves a lot and, um, and we pat ourselves on the back a lot. But what we need to be doing is getting out and, and going wider. I think it, it's, it's about going wide and, and sharing opinion and being proud of where you are in the service department industry. But I do think um, it, it's, it's development over the last 20 years. If, if you see how many apart hotels have been building um, across Europe and, and especially because we were probably later to the game than Asia and Americas, but the apart hotels, are, you know, they're really coming into their own and there's some amazing brands coming through. Um, I just think that corporate housing absolutely has its space in secondary locations and residential locations. And I believe that alternative accommodation, if that's what we want to continue to call it, has its space in, in secondary and very tertiary locations where projects maybe go or where you've got a, a family relocating. Um, I, I think we're doing, personally, I'm going to say, but then again, I am a salesperson. I'm going to say that I think that the, the selling is, is, you know, Kevin's here and it has been here for 15 years. He was an early adopter of, uh, of service accommodations. Frustration is that he just can't click the button to a point of sale and buy it online. And I understand that, but it's hard to buy anything that's going to got, you know, huge terms and conditions over 28 nights. It, it, it's hard to buy that a, a very quickly. There's a high risk in that as well. I'm going to need to move the discussion on because we've got a lot of ground yet to cover. And I'm getting more questions here. And this is a question to the whole panel. So whichever one of you wants to answer first, dive in. And the question is this. How do you expect shifting corporate travel trends to impact on the short-term rental industry post-COVID? Who'd like to pick that one up? I think, well, um, we do, we do, um, we do short, short letting more in, in, in our uh, budget uh, apartments, but we've noticed that's been much slower to return, the, that leisure sticking in the city centre. Um, I think going forward, it's trust. Uh, trust is going to be very important. Cleanliness, if you say you're deep cleaning it, actually deep cleaning it. And I think, um, obviously, within short-term rentals, you've got the big apart hotel operators, very, very commercial, very well run, you know, that can guarantee that. But then I think Vivian mentioned about the trust around Airbnb and, you know, private landlords and stuff. That, that's going to be a challenge. And I think um, whether it's an airline, whether it's a train, uh, uh, that transport part needs to be clean and they need to deliver on that. And then when people check in, they're going to need to deliver that. And I think people's senses are heightened 
in terms of that quality level. And I think that's going to be a big trend where people may have searched for cheap accommodation, cheap apartments in Barcelona. It might be clean apartments in Barcelona or mm. safe apartments in Barcelona. And I think you get that after, uh, you know, unfortunate terrorist attacks. People want to, to know things are safe and secure and people ask more questions about where the safe is. Not rational because the terrorist doesn't come to your room and uh, steal your passport, but it's that sense of fear. And I think the industry has to work together to make travelers, whether it's a leisure guest or a corporate guest, feel very comfortable in that environment. And that is, you know, if you do um, have a COVID policy, you deliver that. And I think that's just really important and more so in the short-term rental industry. Anybody else? Oh, yeah, can I come in there? Actually, I agree with you, Steve, completely there. And I, and I think from our perspective, we've, um, we've actually put together and a part of a forum um, of uh, operators, agents and accreditors um, to actually drive um, a global minimum standard that makes it easier for the likes of, um, of Kevin and his team to choose uh, accommodation that's, that's been accredited. And the reason why we've done that is because it had to become more ad hoc. It was fabulous in the key locations, but the more the secondary locations or other markets, say even making bookings into the Middle East, there's only a, a couple of accredited properties. So we've been working with the tourism offices and, the, and the, um, the providers in those areas to bring the accreditation together, but just have one minimum standard, a global minimum standard that works for all, rather than everyone having to market their own standards. It's gone a little bit like um, whenever there's a, a core thing that happens in an industry, everyone just focusing on that. Actually, what it needs to become is just part of the process. So um, we've got some fabulous accreditors that are working with us to deliver a global minimum standard. And I do think it's really important um, that we do that. And I, and I don't see a way around it except for um, providing that the future of this is providing trackability, traceability and validity in all of those areas. So at the moment, everyone's holding their badges up and I'm really delighted that they've got badges but now we need to have the year that it's valid for and probably the last time that they were checked. Um, and then there needs to be some ad hoc bookings, uh, ad hoc um, checks of those uh, properties as well. But more importantly right now, Mark, and I think this is going to be an important part of our future is um, there's going to be a, a, a more uh, a, um, accreditation that needs to be done around the digital, digitalization of, sanit of sanitation of products. So, um, there's going to be a whole new industry that comes out of sanitation which is around when was it last checked how was it checked who checked it and accountability for that so i do think that there's that's going to be the next big thing that's going to happen is there's going to be some wicked technology come out that's going to start showing the last time it was checked who checked it and there'll be kind of a, a an accountability to that last check let me bring kevin in at this point um some would say that this whole issue in and around cleanliness it's something that should be in place anyway. I mean, we all understand it's about restoring confidence and giving people confidence um, in a particular provider, whether it be accommodation, air travel, or the rest. But isn't there a danger that in, by, by putting so much emphasis on cleanliness that that becomes more of a marketing tool? Than what you Your thoughts on that, please, Kevin? Yeah, I think that's a good point, actually. Um... In my experience, the, the, the partners that we've worked with or we are working with have been very um, uh, quick and responsive in this area. Um, and, and actually they've delivered some, some great sort of programs. And, and, you know, and I think to be fair, they've done that, they've, they've turned that around pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, the problem that we've had, I think, is around standardization. Um, and I know there's been a number of different sort of programs to try to sort of help with that um you know there's unfortunately a lot of the companies have been operating in silos which hasn't been helpful um uh but i think the, the biggest challenge that i see here is is actually how you deliver that information to the to the end user to the to the consumer in in in, mm -hmm. in the in the booking sort of in the booking experience again so if i go back to our sort of program you know you know, in the travel agency environment and in the online booking tool environment, you know, none, I'm not aware that, that any, um, there's any sort of standardization around delivering information here to the, to the booker or to the traveler. 
So whilst the, you know, the providers themselves have done, done a great job, the sort of intermediaries and the technology companies haven't delivered anything that, that can, you know, that can push that information out to the, to the, to the booker. Um, and that's disappointing because, you know, you're talking, you know, in our, in our company, we're working with, you know, the sort of the largest international operators here um, and they haven't delivered anything in this area. Um, now, you know, they could argue that, you know, that their, their business model has been completely demolished by this pandemic. Um, their revenues are, are you know, are, are no, are nowhere. Um, and to put an, an investment like this in, which is a short term, probably investment is, 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 is a tough ask, but you know, it's all about, it's all about sort of giving that confidence back to the, to the traveler, to the booker, um, to, to get them, to get them moving without that, I'm afraid, um, nothing, nothing's going to change. And I think we have to be realistic, really, you know, the way the pandemic is sort of moving up and down, we've got lockdowns have coming in. You know, there, there's more restrictions um, taking place. I think until, really, until there is, um, uh, you know, a medical solution to this, I, I truly believe there's, there'll be limited movement, li limited business travel movement, unfortunately, through definitely through the rest of this year. Mm -hmm. Vivi, can I bring you in at this point? And uh, you've obviously heard what, what other panelists have said there. Can we get your take on it? And I'm also very interested from your business's perspective, how you're addressing some of the problems that Kevin's itemised there. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, as all of you have said, uh, sanitization, cleanliness have become now the new standard and that standard level um, will be very high. And, you know, there's a whole new industry that's being created, like Joe mentioned before. Um, but from our perspective, we're also thinking about uh, what happens to um, the, the guests when they check in. So particularly when there is quarantine rules in the areas where they're going to. Um, so we, we are thinking about how to give them um, kind of playbook, how to survive in isolation. Um, how can we make sure they have food, um, grocery delivery, and then perhaps other mindful services like online fitness classes, meditation, to help them just survive those initial 14 days um, when they can't go out. Okay, Steve, your thoughts on this? Well, on the food thing, uh, through lockdown, uh, the team and I have put together a recipe book for, uh, uh, for our, it was actually aimed for the students, but I think it'd be helpful for everyone. Uh, uh, I, I, I love cooking, so it was, it was a bit of a personal, personal point. But no, I think, I think as Joe said, and, and, and Kevin as well, it, it, it's, it is still quite fragmented as an industry, and I think all these accreditation bodies and everything else has made it quite difficult. We, we had a COVID policy we had to do very, very early on in April, before the government regulations, because we felt mm -hmm. we had to do something just to, to have something in place that we could show people that we were taking it seriously. And then we've adapted it as we've, go, we've, we've gone along. Uh, I think it, it is a challenge. I think, you know, the short stay market in cities is, is is very slow, whether it's hotels or hostels or or apartments. Um, and I agree with Kevin. I think you know, particularly for corporates, you know, Kevin will work with a risk manager or a risk director. I'm sure. And is what is the risk of sending that person to that city for five days? Well, the risk is they could be quarantined when they come back for 14 days and not be able to do their work, or they could catch uh, the worst thing is to catch the virus. So I think I think it has meant that. As operators, we have to work with the agents to find either specific processes and policies for a particular corporate based off a general standard that I think needs to, it will, it will always be national based. I don't think you'll ever get an international standard having tried to do that in the backpacker hostel industry, comparing a city centre hostel in Europe to a beach hostel in Thailand, you, you're not going to have the same standards because it's a different experience. But I think it's important that, as an industry, we, we make sure we, we, we follow through with what we've said we're going to do. And I think there have, have been really good um, policy documents out there to, to follow that are not arduous. And as you said, Mark, you know, apartments should be clean, you know, but there are new things that one has to do and the housekeepers have to wear different equipment. And, you know, there's a different way of dealing with service. A meet and greet is not a meet and greet in terms of, a high five, mm -hmm. it's a distance, this is how your apartment works. 
do you want me to come in and show you or not? Which is the opposite of what hospitality is about, where it's full service, really trying to help. So I think it's that flexibility. And, and, and I think Kevin said it, some of the bigger brands have struggled a little bit because to change a policy with seven and a half thousand hotels is way more challenging than us doing it with our small amount of 250. You know, it, it's, it's, and it's our brand. There's no brand guidelines, it's our brand. So I think that, that, that's one of the challenges, but also opportunities, I think, within the sector that you've got a lot of smaller and medium-sized operators that maybe Joe and Vivi will find are more flexible in terms of changing things for a particular client and following those guidelines than it would be with a larger corporate. I mean, no, Mark, actually, just, oh, sorry. As I say, Mark, just from, from uh, an agency perspective for the last 15 years, we've been trying to encourage people to use entry keypad systems versus uh, um, <laughs> basically a, a people on arrival. And now it's really very popular to have the, um, the keypads. And strangely enough, that we've had less out of hours. People seem to be more in tune to, I don't want a person here, so I will learn how to use this keypad. So that's actually quite interesting. Um, the other thing is, is from a food perspective, there's so many now delivery companies that can get food to people in whatever kind of accommodation they're in, which I've found they've probably really um, found a, a, a big um, increase in their, their needs. But the other thing that's actually quite important is, is you, so we've got the virtual check-ins, but I'm looking at hotels now and I'm wondering when hotels are going to become more self-contained units. So if a hotel's got a lot of, uh, a, a lot of hotel rooms that are not going to be required by um, Kevin's slightly uh, dec decreased the next two, next two to three years. Do they close them up or do they actually reuse them and make them into more potentially self-contained units for this period um, with deliveries, etc.? Because you can you can make two hotel rooms into a pretty good apartment. So I think there's going to be some changes in use of maybe a potential, you know, some apart some large hotels moving over into the long stay space um, because they'll see that that's a, a definite opportunity for them. We've got a very few minutes uh, left to go. I want to try and get two or three more points in, but leading on from that, uh, Joe, so what is it that non-hotels should be learning from hotels and vice versa? Who would like to go first with that? Um, I'd like to go first, if that's okay. Um, we've touched upon this before. Um, you know, Joe mentioned offline booking is still fairly dominant because um, there's potential, always that potential for extension. Um, but that's what's also uh, quite, um, it's worth noting is that human centric approach um, for extended stairs is still going to be there no matter how advanced technology is. Mm. Um, what we can learn from hotel is, is, is delivering that powerful uh, backend uh, distribution and reservation system to make reservation team um, to work more effectively. So instead of, um, you know, it, it, online, uh, sorry, instead of email quoting or email back and forth with PDF, um, we want to encourage the industry to, to um, think forward um, and use uh, a more systematic approach and create um, a collaborative global distribution and reservation system the way GDS has done for airline industry. Yeah, anybody else? I think there's going to be a requirement now, Mark, for more data to be shared, um, you either even if it is about cleanliness and about the happiness of a guest stay, because obviously people are going to be alone for a longer periods of time in apartments, just even from a service perspective, I agree with you, Vivi. But I also think for, for us now to be able to create the future, we can only do it with data and understanding data. And at the moment, it's still yet to be, it's an unknown for everybody. Okay. So, um, we're hoping that you amazing travel buyers, Kevin, can encourage your chairmen to get people on those aeroplanes and move in because without that movement, um, there's a lot of uh, suppliers that are going to start to suffer quite quickly. They've already gone through huge pain. And I think the hospitality industry does have a responsibility to try and you know, drive out that we are safe and secure and do come and, and stay. And as soon as the, the um, opportunities start to reopen for travel, um, I'd encourage all of us to start getting on those flights, using your masks and socially distancing. But, you know, that's, that's my message to us is that we, we do need the movement. I have to tell you, Joe, that's, that's incredibly difficult, though. Um, mm -hmm. We're working in a, in a hugely sort of risk averse sort of environment. Um, yeah. you've, only, you've only got to look at the, you know, the office statistics. I think I saw something the other day that said in London we're only like 30 percent office um, population versus, you know, 70, 80% on, on the continent, right? So, so in the UK right now, 
you know, I think um, uh, our company and, and most, you know, large corporations are incredibly uh, anxious um, around yeah. this area. So, yeah, I think it's very On that point, Kevin, um, clearly business travellers are going to be expected at some point to hit the road again, while other people are still working from home. This is a question, by the way, from the floor. Do we as a sector need more pressure from government to return to work for activity to pick up? What's your take on that? 100%. Yeah, 100%. I mean, unfortunately, the, the, the sort of the messages from government here has been so mixed. Um, and, and that's just led to uncertainty, anxiety. Um, and and that's, that's in the general population and I think in, in companies as well. Um, so, yeah, unfortunately, either, either it has to come from government or it has to come from the industry. Um, we've got to get the message out there to people that it is safe to travel, it is safe to go to an airport, get on an aeroplane, go to a hotel. Um, uh, without that, unfortunately, I, I don't see any, any significant change until, yeah. as I said earlier, there's a, there's a, a medical solution. Yeah. I'm going to have to cut in at this point because I want uh, they to ask one final question of each of you. And in a very short period of time, I need a really snappy response from, from each of you. The question is this. What will the accommodation sector look like in two to three years time? Who would like to go first? I can go first. Um, so the incoming workforce uh, will be dominated by um, not just millennials, but also the Gen Zs who are coming into our workforce um, in the next decade or so. Um, so they believe in responsibility to address social and environmental issues and they care about genuine content that feels real and authentic. So anyone who, who could deliver this, um, obviously all these um, superb services from hospitality uh, businesses, but at the same time that authenticity as well as um, how they can address social and environmental impact could be a winner. Who's next? I'll go. Um, I think you'll see less options. Unfortunately, I think there'll be um, heavy consolidation um, and there'll be a number of um, operators and companies which will decide to close um, or, you know, owners will, will, will change accommodation into apartments or, or retail or offices. I, I, I think the demand for accommodation over the next couple of years is going to be significantly impacted, unfortunately, and I, I see that having a big impact on, on choice. Steve? Yeah, I think as it will take a little time for uh, to volumes to, to get back to where it was pre-COVID, is that people will travel with purpose more, whether for work, for holiday, and so that accommodation provider, <clears throat> consistency will be everything, and because there will be the consolidation uh, in the market. I think uh, those brands that do not fulfill that consistency from a service, a cleanliness, uh, an offering point of view um, will, will find it tougher um, because the volumes will be less for a while. And so, uh, to be honest, I think uh, there's, a, there's two prongs for me. One of them is the political side of, of what's happening across the globe at the moment. I think. Um, with the removal of the um, privacy shield system in the EU is going to have a big impact on um, US companies uh, doing business in, in, in the EU. And uh, we need to watch what happens with that over the next six months. It's going to be silent for the moment because there's not a lot of people traveling around, but there is going to be some big impact. And the second thing I do think there's going to be, um, from an industry perspective, a, a, an absolute increase in the length of stay. I do agree that um, is going to be an increased length of stay. I think there's going to be less business travel. And I think if there is business travel and it's shortened, it's literally going to be a day trip um, because I think they'll see the value of going in, doing the business, coming back out again. Um, as a salesperson, I'm just looking forward to traveling again and, and seeing people. Okay, well, thank you, Joe, And very, very timely because we are nearly out of time. So what I would just like to do is to thank all of our speakers today. I'd like to thank Vivi and Kevin Steve and Joe, thank you ever so much for all of you for attending and thank you also for your questions. Now the fourth in our series of webinars is on a very different topic and Joe alluded to it earlier on with some of our biggest trade associations experiencing serious difficulties. Just who can industry professionals turn to for trust, turn to for guidance and turn to for everything else that we need. So. We're going to be tackling that topic Thursday, the 10th of September at 11 a.m. 
Don't forget though that uh, if you've enjoyed this webinar and you'd like one for your business, we'll be happy to oblige. Once again, a reminder about the Urban Living Festival, 25th to the 26th of November. We've got a fantastic lineup of sponsors already confirmed for this event. They are on your screen now, together with our media partners on the screen following. If anyone on this call would like to be involved from a sponsorship perspective, please contact Katie. Her contact details are on screen. All that rem uh, remains is for me to thank you for your time. Hope you've enjoyed it. And please, let's, let's hear from you going forward. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you, Mark. Thank you.